by Steve Logan. Welcome, uh, Logan. And, uh, and uh, his slide will be available on the website at the end of the day today. So uh, we are working on that. So please welcome Steve Logan. Later on today, I gave a talk about getting your code into the Hadoop code base. This is about stuff that's in there and going in there soon. As people may know from the earlier talk, I like to make fun of people in the audience today. Is there a Dave Beach in the room? OK, is there a Lawrence Wilcox, Eric Delwa? OK, you three will do. Um, all right, so high, avail well, high availability Hadoop. People ask questions like, could I keep my data in Hadoop? Will it get lost? Will it go, will it, you know, does, do things go wrong and what happens then? And then they find out what's done and they say, can you make it better? So we're going to cover that. First thing is HDFS was built from the ground up on the assumption that they could use commodity hardware for all the worker nodes in the cluster with the failure rates of commodity hardware and it wouldn't mind, it wouldn't mind the failure of individual disks. And the secret to that is replication. It replicates copies of all your blocks across different machines. So here we have one file that's in three places, and any one of those places can go down. In fact, two of the places can go down, and the data won't get lost. It'll deal with it. So we take down the data node. And the name node that's getting the reports in suddenly says, that machine hasn't reported for a while, and tells it increases the replication count. It says, re-replicate the others, and they appear somewhere else. So that's the basic way of dealing with failure, is replication. Here we go. There we go. Replication has happened. Took a while to report in. So you can deal with the loss of individual disks or individual entire machines with relative ease. When a disk fails, the rest of the disks keep going in the data nodes, so that's very resilient. Loss of a whole disk, a machine, it's starting to become more of an issue now disks are bigger. Now that you can get something like 36 gigabytes on a single machine, as Steve pointed out, you have to worry about this more. As well as replication, the other issue is data integrity. The secret here is a 32-bit checksum is verified. It's created every 512 bytes. And it's checked whenever there's a read, during a map, job, anything like that. When you're reading in a file or a copy, that gets checked. When there's a sign of corruption, it triggers a re-replication process, the same thing, so we re-replicate. If it turns out that all the other blocks are corrupt as well, then there's a special state called call the operator and don't delete any of these files because you may be able to merge them. So the goal is keeping an eye on things. Yahoo, in experience, they've lost a very few number of blocks and it turned out those were some bugs that have been fixed already. So block corruption is incredibly rare, which is good. So we keep our data safe. We can handle failures. One of the things, a trouble spot, is when your entire switch fails. There goes a the switch. Switch is gone. What's going to happen now? You, David, what's going to happen now? OK, go home. There's one option. You're not in operations, are you, anymore? OK. Um, anyway, so there goes. The name node doesn't notice the switch has failed. All it notices is that one or more data nodes haven't reported in. So the first one doesn't report in. It says, start replicating. At the same time, another data node goes down. Starts replicating that. And gradually, as more data nodes goes down, it keeps replicating, which is fine, except the network traffic on your other machines and their backbones is just really ramped up. If you're under load at the time, then you have a bandwidth problem. This is called a replication storm. It's weird enough, the bigger your cluster gets, the less the, the impact of loss of a single rack is because of a smaller fraction of the system. On a small two rack, three rack cluster, it actually becomes more significant. Does it really matter? Well, Google did a paper saying racks correlate with failures, which is a combination of top of rack switches, power supplies, and the ops team. Um, Microsoft say top of rack switches fails, and Facebook, in a notorious incident, misconfigured their routers and they, they took down the entire cluster this way because they were getting continuous traffic in. They'd shut the network in half. It was overloaded. 
and that triggered more timeouts, which triggered more replication, which triggered more timeouts, and then there went their cluster. What do you can do about this? Current trend is to actually go for 10 gigabit Ethernet on a rack because that gives you really good bandwidth with modern disks. The other thing you can play with is having multiple top of rack switches with kind of dual bonded stuff. The nice thing about that is when, if one switch fails, the other switch stays up and everything's happy. The not so nice thing about that is you have a lot more things to test regarding wiring up your machines and their failure handling. So there's a lot more ways things can get miswired. Other one, just have bigger clusters, or Facebook have played with different block placement algorithms. But those are, those are kind of large scale issues. If you've got a small cluster, I would just go for 10 gigabit Ethernet. Along with that, there's a name node. That is, in HDFS, that's the point of failure, the SPOF. For people who don't know, the name node, it saves its state to various places you configure it to, usually something local, usually some kind of shared drive like a SAN, iSCSI, something like that. And that's a journal, a list of changes with checksums to make sure that's not corrupted as well. When you take it down or restart it, that journal gets read in, replayed into memory, another checkpoint is saved, and then the system comes back up. There is this thing called a secondary name node in the system, which isn't really a secondary name node at all. It's kind of a checkpointing thing that gets a stream of the logs, checkpoints the data back to the file system so that when your cluster comes up, it comes up faster. Even though it's a single point of failure, on a well-managed cluster, it actually fails really, really rarely. It's only one of the boxes. The problem is that failing is quite low. People tend to buy higher-end hardware for it because it's a point of failure. And it doesn't go down very often. So already, effectively, you get five nines of availability, at least in Yahoo's experience. There's the failover thing happening. The key thing is, if it doesn't come up, try restarting. If it doesn't work, move it. At that point, you may have, if you change your host name, you're going to have to restart everything. So it's visible, and that's kind of annoying. The main cost, then, is this hassle of actually doing it by hand, um, actually keeping the spare server and the ops team around. Where is Steve gone? Your ops team. Anyway, so... It's keeping these people in the suits happy. So what can we do? All right. In Hadoop 1, we've done some work on trying to reduce the impact of that single point of failure going down. For HDFS 2, there's been work going on about saying the name node can fail over live, and then there's been some very, very recent work on actually getting rid of that shared storage altogether. The other thing is this notion of kind of adding resilience to the entire stack, just as HGFS can deal with the loss of worker nodes without too many problems, just as MapReduce can deal with the loss of its worker nodes without problems. Can we make upstream clients deal with transient outages of the system and say, okay, it's gone for a bit, don't worry, wait for it to come back. And yeah, you can do that actually. It, it kind of, it hides a lot of problems. So that's the notion of a kind of a full stack availability is what it's called. And it's just extra improvements in the client library to hide the fact that things are down, but optionally make it visible if you care about it. So in this world, you've got the clusters that go down, something's gone down, and a failover is taking place. While that's taking time, normally your apps would fail and say something's gone wrong. But what we've done is we've added more the ability to configure your clients just in your cluster configuration to say, why don't you wait for a bit? You're going to give 60 seconds for the system to come back up or two minutes before you start timing out. For a lot of things, just blocking is in fact the ideal solution. The tricky one is actually some of the job submission job tracker stuff, which I'll get to earlier. In that world, the job tracker depends on the file system and it really has to be aware that the file system is down. You know, once they come back up, everyone's happy again. So for Hadoop 1, that's Apache 1.04. 304 and above in HTTP one. We added availability through VMware vSphere and Red Hat Linux. Earlier today, we had a demo from VMware of this actually, and I'm going to be doing the Red Hat one now. In these two contexts, what we're not doing is making fundamental changes to the name node. What we're doing is just adding the monitoring so that existing clustering infrastructure can say, hey, this has gone down, and react to it. For 
VMware, what you can do is host, at the, very, at the minimum, your master nodes in VMware, they have a, a vSphere HA cluster, which provides availability within VMs in that world, and you can move your, VM, your master nodes in there, and it keeps track of the health. What happens is you create a separate VM for every service, like the name node, like the job tracker, the HBase master, and VMware keeps an eye on it. When the cluster thinks it's, when, v, when vSphere thinks that VM is dead, then it, it kills and restarts that VM. If the entire physical host that that VM is running on goes away, oops, then vSphere brings up all the VMs on that machine to another. It just restarts the VMs. So it, it's good at preventing corruption, but you have to make sure you save all your state to a hard disk outside. Your, in this world, your worker nodes can be physical or virtual. It doesn't make any difference. So in this context, we have something called canary monitoring. We've, we've added a little monitor daemon that runs on any... It runs inside the, the VMware VM, and it sends heartbeats up to VMware to say, I'm alive. There's a list of probes to say, I'm happy, all's well. And it just checks what's going on. If there's a failure, what happens is it, it actually just stops sending pings to vSphere, but then 60 seconds, vSphere kills the JVM. No, not JVM, the entire SVM. So it's when the canary stops singing. That's why it's called canary monitoring. We've got a set of liveness probes. I'll go into more detail in a second. One of the hard things in this world is dif differentiating. Detecting a dead process is hard. Detecting a, a hung process is trickier because you can open a socket or a port and it just doesn't respond. So eventually you have to have a timeout saying this is hung. But also when garbage collection kicks in on a JVM, that's hung as well. So you, your challenge is trying to decide whether something is hung or just garbage collecting. In Java 6, we just rely on timeouts. Java 7, there are some management calls. You can maybe find out what's going on. So we have a set of liveness probes. Is a process running? Can you check a port? Can you do a get? Is HDFS got, is read only? Is read write? Is the job tracker up? And is the job tracker out safe mode? And actually, you can glue these together to effectively have the basic monitoring of most of the services in a, in a Hadoop cluster. And they just, you, re, you can reconfigure it, and then vSphere will track that service, which is, it is convenient. The other story is on Red Hat Linux. This is, well, this is HA Linux, which is a different world. It's all physical. And here you have a cluster of HA machines that are running Linux HA. And here, each of those is a, it's a physical machine with its own IP address. They talk using something called, I think it's Pacemaker, between each other. So they're sending heartbeats between each other. They're keeping track of what services are running. And what you do is you rip out your normal init D logic. You rip out all the bits of code where you say, I want to mount this file system. Here's my network settings. Instead, you hand it all over to configuration files to Linux HA. Mm -hmm. So you configure it to say, wherever you run the name node, it has to exist somewhere in this cluster, ideally on machine one. NFS mount this disk, mount this floating IP address to that particular machine. When that machine fails, HA Linux says, this isn't heart beating anymore. It triggers a failover, it remounts the disk, and it floats the IP address as well. So we use a, a floating IP address that is your, the public IP address to your name node, and it moves around. And everything else, nothing else should really notice that it's moved. So your classic NAD scripts are gone. We've added some more. The, the same status probes and now run in this new extended init D bash script. Same thing about detecting stuff. It's been lots of fun testing it. One of the funny, if there's one thing I don't like here is this floating IP address does not work across switches because the ARP protocol that tells things where to root stuff can take a while to propagate. If it's all going to the same switch, then it says, okay, we just talk to that switch and everything's fine. So that, that's the only bit of petulance, is that, is that kind of re resilience thing. The other thing is, it does take a while to test this stuff because you've got a configuration file which you really do need to test on every installation to make sure it's actually working. 
Does it work? And the answer is, it does for me. Here is actually one of my test cases written in Groovy, where I'm handing a closure back, saying, take this little function here, this bit of code, make sure HGFS is up, run this piece of code, the name node should come back up within about a minute or so, if it hasn't, this test has failed. On this particular test, I am SSHing into the name node server, finding whatever process has saved its process ID there, and just killing it. See what happens when that one hanging it. Uh, we've got a set of tests for that to simulate different failures in the cluster, and by SSHing into the boxes and seeing what happens. The other thing we're working on is a reference to the Chaos Monkey, this little library, Apache Chaos is its working title, of actually having a library that can kill arbitrary VMs or hosts and networks by actually going in there and rebooting them. On the virtual world, it would just be issuing the, rel the, re you know, the relevant command to the, the VM manager. In the physical world, you want to do things like turn the power off from a switch or a router over if you have one of those power switches on the network. We need somewhere for this to live in Apache, and we're thinking about Apache Big Top as being the home for this stuff. But it'd be really nice for availability across the whole of the Apache software stack to say, we have a common library which can just destroy machines on a whim. Does it work? The answer is, it doesn't take that long for a small cluster. We're looking for a 60-node system. It comes back up in about three minutes. Half the problem being detection failover. More time is spent detecting failover than recovering on a small cluster. As your cluster gets bigger, more time is spent recovering than anything else. So as your cluster gets bigger, you're looking at more, more minutes, about five plus minutes overall. In a very large cluster, the kind of the classic Yahoo scale cluster, dissolution is overweight, or not overweight. It's, their clusters are too big, so this thing just takes too long, which is why HGFS2 comes into play. But for the small clusters, it seems to work, though there is a temporary outage. And that leads to the problem of, do your clients know? How are your clients going to care that your thing's down for a bit? What we've done is we've changed. There was always a little bit of support for this, a connection being down for about 10 to 30 seconds. Now we've made it configurable to say, here is how many tries, and you know, keep retrying. You can set that in your site configuration, and all clients will automatically pick up. You can say, wait for five minutes, 10 minutes, or 15 seconds. We've also added the ability for applications to turn this off. Oh, well, it's implicit in configuration. But the reason for that is some applications, and particularly ones a job tracker, need to know that the file system is actually down. And that's, everything else doesn't care. Pig doesn't care. Uzi doesn't care. Hive doesn't care. Agebase doesn't really care that either. We, 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 we test all this stuff by having a cluster randomly tearing it up and down while running things like Agebase performance tests on it and seeing that everything works. Job tracker is fussier. One of the problems is actually the job submission process you have to save to the file system as well, so that gets confused. But the other one is, is that while you're running this, if you have map would reduce jobs that are actually talking to HGFS, they will either fail or they will time out, so they will block. And either way, the task tracker reporter is failing, so the job tracker goes, that job's broken, it's failed. But also then it goes, oh, Everything I send to this task tracker is failing. That means that machine's broken, so it gets blacklisted. That's another aspect of Hadoop's design, that if a machine appears to fail all its work, the job tracker says, this is an unreliable box, we can't trust it, which is normally pretty good. In this world, the job tracker would be confusing a failing machine, saying the machine's failing, and it's not really a dependent service is failing. So in this world, you can turn on monitoring. It's actually probing HGFS. When HGFS is down, it goes into safe mode offline and says, while I'm down, I won't accept any new jobs. I won't care that anything's gone down. And once the file system has come back up, I will start pushing my work out again. Also, when the job tracker itself comes back up, it'll replay its queue. Now, one thing we looked at was actually, could we really do availability in the job tracker as well? And the answer is, not really. You would bring the system to its knees at scale because it's storing all of its state in memory. And to try and save that somewhere else, like a database, would be such a performance hit that it, it can't happen. I think in Yarn we can do that, and it's on the to-do list is do this in Yarn. 
All right, we tested it, mentioned that before. We just have a clusters where you bring things up and down while running everyone else's test clusters. The results for this and the HUS2 stuff that not just us, but people in Fedora are doing was didn't cause any problems, although people actually tend to find other bugs. When you're doing this up and down, you find completely unrelated bugs, which have existed in the code for a while, but nobody really noticed because cluster failures are so incredibly rare. And when it happened, people probably didn't notice that it was a bug in something like HGFS because the cluster was down and they were too busy worrying that the cluster was down. So during this test phase, there's probably more outages, you know, deliberate killings of a, an HGFS file system than has ever taken place before in the history of Hadoop. <coughs> and now I have a demo that may actually work. I say that because, let's find this stuff. I'm doing some networking things here. Um, here we have a job tracker. Job tracker is running away. It's up and running. Name node two. Here we have a file system, DFS up and running. Its IP address rhel58-nn. This is the floating IP address. If I go to there's a cluster stack command. The cluster, it says the name node service is running on rhel 58 nn one which means name node one. It's another virtual machine here, and it, it's happy. I was a little program to test what's going on, and I'm saying, right, let's have a look at the, what's happening in the file system. And it's issuing an ls <coughs> command repeatedly. Everything's working. Now, I switch over to a different VM. Name node one. This is my my name node. And I'm going to kill this VM without any warning whatsoever. Boom. That machine has ceased to exist. This program here that was doing LS operations, it's blocked. It's it's not immediately timing out, it's just noticing this blocking operation. And my battery is now charged. I'm grateful for that fact. Um, if we go to this thing, it's not loading yet. I'm not reloading that because the file system's back up yet. No, oh, it's, it's happening too long. And the job tracker is in safe mode. It says, I'm down. One thing things actually I actually do is you can go into safe mode manually in the job tracker as well, which is kind of handy because ops people can say, we're going to just stop accepting work right now but not lose anything ongoing. And if you're doing Hadoop jobs, you will often find that this page, the MapReduce admin page, is the page you stare at the most. So we're going to put messages in there as well to say, it is offline, come back on Tuesday, David. So that's basically it. And if we go back to the client, actually, if it's come back up, has it come back up yet? Not yet. Let's see. It's not coming back up today, is it? It's starting. For some reason, it's starting. So. Oh, is it coming back up yet? Job track is in safe mode, so it's actually coming up now. It's coming up slowly. So it just took a while to restart there, and here we are, gradually coming out of the file system there. The, that's up there. It's waiting for something to report in, I think. Job tracker will not come out. It won't come out safe mode until the file system is actually up and live, because it, it needs read-write support. So that appears to be file system coming back up. So that's us doing, we, we've just taken down one VM and it's moved to the other. And that is the basics of Linux HA. Strength, it works today. You can do it for arbitrary services. The weakness, you're dependent on someone else's service to get this thing working. And you've got all the configuration stuff of before of NFS and some failure stuff. So it works, but it can, it's just extra configuration testing. Going forward, HGFS2 is going to change the rules again by saying we're going to build HA in from the ground up. We're still going to have the notion of a single master node that you talk to things, but it's going to be the failure handling is actually going to be intrinsic to it. So there is an implementation, there's a notion of a journal manager where your name node can talk to <coughs> a journal manager which runs a file system, and it's sending all its state changes to something else, 
which can then something else can pick up. And on each node, we have a failure controller. It's a bit like the canary monitor. It's keeping an eye on the name node. It's probing it continuously, saying, are you alive, are you dead? And it is reporting to Apache Zookeeper. Hands up, who knows what Apache Zookeeper is? OK, that's pretty most people. That's pretty good. Zookeeper is something a bit like Google's Chubby, which is a clustering service designed to share information in a consistent, consensual state, the kind of thing that would keep Lamport happy. But effectively, it looks like a directory service. You can put things in there, and they will be guaranteed to be the same everywhere else. You can use it. They're kind of self-electing, so they, have, they, they, they can see who's in charge and be core it. So you can listen to what's going on there, and you can say, right, is there anything else that is registered as a name node? No, OK, we're going to be it. So you take down name node fails. Actually, one more thing in this is that in this world, you configure the data nodes to talk to two job track, two, two name nodes. They report into both. But the other one's in standby. It's not actually in charge. It's just reading what's going on. So it knows what's happening. It's up to date with a lot of the state. There's actually the name nodes are coming in, but it's not actually getting all the edit changes which are going into this journal, the shared file system. When the name node process goes down, the failure controller knows what's happening, and it reports. It says, I'm down. At which point, the other, or another, you have more than one standby name node, takes over and says, right, I'm in charge. It starts responding to edit operations. It starts talking to the data nodes to tell them what's going on. And it fails over fast. In this world, you get faster failover. There is a bit of extra complexity, and now you have to configure the data nodes to talk to multiple name nodes, which isn't that hard. But also, all the clients have to change as well, because they have to be given a list of these things and to try them in order. And that is, that is visible to the clients, unless they actually use something like Zookeeper themselves. One of the things I want to do, I'm getting involved in this stuff, is do better floating IP address as well, so that at least there your web bookmarks will stay the same, because web URLs, the web page should move around as well. That's what it should be doing. You shouldn't have to care. So I mentioned that the file system journal manager. There are, in fact, three journal managers out there. File journal manager, bookkeeper journal manager. Bookkeeper is a shared journaling thing from Yahoo, Apache Bookkeeper. And as of about three weeks ago, there is something called a quorum journal manager built into Hadoop. It's in Hadoop trunk source code. And it actually eliminates that shared file system need instead. Instead, there's little things called journal nodes where you have to have three or more of them in your cluster. In these worlds, you always need an odd number of things, so their elections come out right. And they, they get streamed the changes from the live name node. So every time you do something name node, creating a file, deleting a file, moving directories, those events get streamed over to the journal nodes. When name node goes down, other one comes up, and the, the journal nodes, they, they should be consistent with what's going on. They better have a vote on saying, here is the last change I went through, the quorum. So that way, you know what's happening. The strength of this is, because you don't need that shared file system, this should scale down really well. You don't need, you don't need an NFS server anymore. You don't need to configure that NFS server that works so well, so that uh, you need less ops people, and more importantly, you need less competence ops people, so we can just get away with kind of less skill in the system. And it, you know, it should be pretty good. Big question is, when is it ready? Um, Lars will probably say now, if he's in the room, because it's actually shipping right now in CDH 4.2, which came out about two weeks ago. For Apache land in Hortonworks, we still think it's in beta phase. And it's, it's an issue as to how much it really matters. We've got to, we've got to base, the, there's testing to say, has it all been field tested? And it's good in this beta test that other people do that discovery of problems. And it's just a general testing of a large file system because it matters the most. I think it's important that people download that beta test and test all this stuff and try switching clusters on and off to see what happens. Uh, ultimately, it'll be good. The only variable is when. And that's, that's HGFS, but that's more, that's only a bottom of the stack. It's depended on by the MapReduce layer and HBase. But there's a whole stack up there, and we need to think about doing this all the way up. So we need to design things like the HGFS clients, 
the high performance, all this stuff to handle failures. I want to put monitoring and restart into all these services without needing to be running on Linux HA or VMware HA. And we're discussing that in Big Top a bit, how we could do that kind of stuff. I think we should also just adopt Zookeeper as the generic lookup service so that anything can move around. You stop having a notion of there is a job tracker on this, in my cluster on this specific machine to say, I always go to Zookeeper, who are, whose address I have hard coded, and then I look up that, and that tells me where the other services live. So we can be very, very dynamic. In the YARN stuff, if you're in the YARN talk earlier today, that doesn't have resilience built in yet. It has the thing, central thing that manages all the resources, the resource manager, it's got a small enough amount of memory, we should be able to make it high availability relatively easily. There's just been focused on getting yarn working and out the door before we care about it. So our final slide, we can do all this stuff, we can go all the way up the stack, but something, there's always a single point of failure in there. Um, there's a big question about where it is, and the answer is, just wait. You know, I mean, it'll find you, and it could be something really obscure. It could be like the batch of service you got off Steve all have the same RAM, you know, RAM slots that need to be pulled out and replaced. It could be your telco turns out to be sharing a line with somebody else and all your network connections has gone down. It, it, you know, it's often external and obscure. So high availability is not perfect availability. And after the fact, you always go, this was really obvious. Why didn't I know? But during the time, you think you've eliminated all the problems and there's always something lurking out there. So don't worry about it and share the fact up to everybody else saying, we're doing our best we can, but there's always some kind of outage origin everywhere. All right, so that's that. Got some questions. And while asking questions, I'll point out that Hadoop Summit is coming up soon and the call for papers is open. So if you want to talk about your Hadoop experiences or anything like that, start going to that web page and say, I want to talk about it. And otherwise, come along and see us there. Now, who has some questions? You, Steve. No? So, actually, I do have a question. Okay. Um, so, with the, the Red Hat and the VMware, okay. um, those are both um, active passive configurations. The question is the Red Hat and the VMware stuff. The, its existing name, though, just gets restarted, effectively, on both services. You're starting, there's nothing active. It's kind of completely dead. So the VM gets restarted on VMware. And for the Linux one, it's starting, you, you provide a, a list of actions, a sequence list of actions to say mount NFS, move this IP address over, then start the name node. So it, it's completely starting it from nothing in those two situations. So the question is, how many servers? For the Linux HA stuff, you can have a pool but remember, you can have multiple services on each one. So you have three machines. You can have the job tracker, the secondary, the other things. And you, can, you basically provide a list saying, always bring the name node up on this one first, JT up on this one first. Machine two can be either of them. And let it kind of work itself out. For VMware, because everything's virtualized, you can have all your services in one or two VMs. And they can be moved around. And it's, apart from the memory requirement, it's not at all visible to you because they're actually VMs. It's isolated. It looks like you have a pool of servers for your manager nodes, but they're all on the same physical host. Any other questions? All right. Uh, okay, so it shows that uh, when the name node is broken, uh, we can restart the machine, it takes what, half a minute. Yeah. But uh, what is the situation that we are about? The name node is dead. Okay, the, the only thing we have is secondary name. Okay, quick. Question is what happens when your name node is down, you only have a secondary name node. Well, you basically have to, re when that happens, the, the, you have to start a name node somewhere. The ones with VMware and Red Hat Automate it, right now you do it by hand to say start a name node. It comes back up, two things have to happen there. The name node has to replay its edit log to get into the right state, say this is my state. It reads that back in and it reads all the operations. It's all checked some now. There was a classic issue with Hadoop where it didn't check some each logs. And you, often when a machine crashed, the last entry in the journal was corrupt. And people would have to go in by hand and edit this kind of binary file to delete it. It's now checked some. 
So you have to do that replay. And the, the role of the secondary laminar is to make those checkpoints so replay comes up fast. The other action is that the name node has to wait for all the worker nodes to report in, saying, I am here, I have the data. Otherwise, it stays in safe mode. You say, you can see my directory structure, but I do not have all the copies of the blocks I need. Historically, it's taken a while to log in. There's been some bugs fixed on that, so it takes less time. The bigger your cluster, the longer it takes to report in. So I think that's kind of like, that's where the couple of minutes thing comes from, is actually the, the replay and report in delay more than anything else. HGFS2 eliminates that because the, the data nodes, they're reporting into both machines simultaneously. So you can do a failover without that phase of the process. No, 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 no. Um, Yahoo were finding it would take about 30 minutes to 40 minutes to do a full replay and restart of their, their full-size production clusters. If something's taking hours, you've got a problem. Minutes. Minutes is all you should be expecting today. And the small clusters, you're looking at single digits under five minutes. With this stuff, with the, the, the HFS2 stuff, the biggest problem is actually it can take more time to detect a failure, or especially distinguish hung from a crash, than it could actually do to restart because you have to give the hung period a period of grace to say, oh, well, maybe just blocked for a bit or overloaded, so let's not overreact to it. And there's no easy way to distinguish hung from dead in some situations. All right, next question. Okay, is there experience with alternative file systems such as ClusterFS? I am not aware of ClusterFS. Oh, sorry, no, I know what ClusterFS is. It's the Red Hat one. I'm not aware of being used in this context. Alternate file systems have been experimented with. Steve there, busy looking at his pad, will point to HPI Bricks as one alternative file system. Uh, people from VMware, or people from EMC will point to uh, a zillion, their, their HA file system for doing it which run GPFS, nobody can afford that. Uh, the Ceph people have been doing Hadoop so well, because the Hadoop file system API is, is so very, very simple. You can do stuff on it. One of the, the issues there is actually not so much failover, but testing the whole Hadoop stack on it. The strength of HDFS is very strength. It's designed to work on low-end hardware and costs next to nothing. So it's fantastic low cost of storage. But also, the, it's the one everyone tests Hadoop against. So its behaviors and its failings are known. The other ones, you might end up taking more of the testing costs yourself. But you get an advantage, you can get the uses for it. So it is possible. OK, I'm not going to say don't. I'm just going to say you have to play with it yourself. All right, I think that's the end of my talk, isn't it? <laughs>